Welcome to Theories and Problems in Visual Art. This is history lecture number six, the idea that art changes like a life cycle. This is the last of three lectures on how art history is organized. Lecture four was on periods and megaperiods. Five was on the idea that art history oscillates, that styles alternate or oscillate. And this one is about the idea that art changes like a life cycle, that it develops like a person's life. And I've added a last idea on paradoxical history. So these life cycle theories are often called ages of man theories. It's always gendered masculine. That's a Renaissance painting by Titian called The Three Ages of Man. On the right, uh, babies. On the left, that represents maturity. And in the background, old age. Um, which is represented by a bald old man who can't do anything but sit in a field and hold two skulls in his hands. The idea that culture and art grow up like people and get old and die is shared by a number of cultures. It was an idea in ancient Greece and Rome, and again in the Renaissance and afterward. In some versions there are three ages of man, like in this painting, and in others there's four or five. And there's a related idea that art passed through gold, silver, and bronze ages. Sometimes they add iron and others. That idea first appears in the ancient Greek poet Hesiod. In art history, the usual scheme is four ages, youth, adolescence, maturity, old age. I'm going to give the two main examples of this, and then after that, a non-Western example. So the principal example in art history is Greek sculpture. For each of these four stages, it's usually possible to list A, the first people to name the age, to say that it was youth or old age and so on. B, the first people to appreciate or praise it, because sometimes the people who named the ages didn't like some of them. And then C, its current description in art history. So the first of the four stages is youth, and I'm following a Roman scheme here, so I'm going to give the Latin. Uh, infantia is Latin for youth. In archaic Greek art, this, the, the idea that there was a youth was first described by the 18th century antiquarian Johann Winckelmann, but he didn't approve of it. He didn't like the art from these years, 600 to 480 BCE, more or less. The way it's described in contemporary art history textbooks is they say the proportions aren't right, quite right yet, the poses are still stiff, they're not really walking or standing, the expressions are formulaic, and so on. Archaic Greek sculpture was first appreciated, it was first praised in the early 20th century around the time of modern art, especially Cubism. It was seen then as raw and direct and free of academic cliches, just as Picasso and other artists were trying to be. So note the three layers to this history. The first time someone described the stages was the 18th century, but the first time this stage was praised was the 20th century because it went along with uh, the art, uh, mo early modern art. Um, and it's possible, of course, that the um, experiments of Picasso and others helped people to appreciate this art. It doesn't, uh, it's hard to know what's cause and what's an effect. And then there was the formulation of a conventional description in art history uh, in the late 20th century. Uh, these are usually called kuroi, just in case you want to look them up. The next stage is adolescence, adolescentia. That's the beginning of maturity. In Greek sculpture, that would be the early classical period, more or less 480 to 450 BCE. Winkelmann was again the first to describe it. In art history textbooks, what's said about this is that the poses are still slightly stiff but the proportions are more natural, and the pose is much better balanced, and the expression is much more refined. That's a grave stele, a grave uh, 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 headstone of a little girl from around 450 or 440 BC. And then comes maturity, maturitas. That's the period of full manhood, gendered. So the first person to describe it and the first person to appreciate it was Winkelmann in the 18th century. He said that art like this is the most perfectly beautiful Greek art. He praised the drapery, the hair, the proportions, the skin, which was often highly polished like it is here, uh, port the portraiture, uh, 
and also the balance, the balance poses. He has a nice uh, description for some of these things. He calls it quiet grandeur. In art history textbooks, this has come to be known as high classical period, 5th and 4th century BCE. And that is one of the most famous uh, examples of it. It's attributed to Praxiteles, one of the major sculptors. Last comes old age, Synectus. After the peak of life has passed, a person or a art gets older, passing through middle age and beginning a decline toward death. In Greek art, that would be Hellenistic art up to the rise of Rome in the first century BCE. Finkelmann wrote some very heartfelt pages on the decadence of Hellenistic art because he thought of it as a model for the decline of other cultures. He thought that it was overly refined, delicate, and imitative rather than original. This art was actually appreciated during the 18th century, but less so in the early 20th century. And that, of course, is the Nike of Samothrace in the Louvre. The other principal example in art history of the four ages theory, or the ages of man theory, is Italian Renaissance art. Youth, in this case, would be the 14th century, including Giotto, who you see here. Um, and that means the first attempts to make naturalistic depictions before perspective was discovered. It's been, um, it's been found that uh, Giotto probably used uh, models of architecture we had, which he had like on a tabletop, because in other paintings you could see sometimes the same temples and gazebos and things turned around from other angles. Um, and he might even have had models of figures that he put in them. At any rate, he didn't have, uh, there was no such thing as perspective back then, nothing that, nothing that he could have studied that would have helped him to get it right better, so you can see him struggling over it. As in the case of Greek sculpture, the awkwardness of the stage meant that it was only appreciated in the early 20th century. Next comes adolescence. That would be the 15th century when perspective uh, was fresh, newly discovered or invented. And again, this stage wasn't appreciated until long after the Renaissance. In this case, it took about four centuries for it to be appreciated. It was praised in the early 19th century um, by Carl Friedrich Humor, a German art historian. Um, he wrote very enthusiastically about it. And then later in the 20th century in England, um, authors like Adrian Stokes and others, modernists. This is adolescence because the perspective is correct and the figures are sculptural, uh, but they're not refined. It's all very straightforward and, and architectural. That's Masaccio's Trinity, um, often said to be the first um, geometrically correct perspective painting. It's in all the survey textbooks for that reason. Then comes maturity, maturitas, and in Italian painting, that would be the High Renaissance. That is the beginning of the 16th century. So here the light is softer and more refined, the faces are more expressive, poses are more fluid. That would be fairly typical uh, to phrases, uh, description to find in an art history textbook. And that is Raphael's Sistine Madonna in Dresden. And last, old age. In Italy, that would be mannerism, late 16th century, the decline of the Renaissance, um, all the way up to the end of the Renaissance, depending on where you want to date it, the end of the 16th, 17th, <clears throat> even 18th centuries. In the usual art historical description, these figures are overly refined. Notice that they're on tiptoe. Even that figure who's um, holding up the legs uh, of the dead Christ is like barely even touching the ground. Figures are also strangely proportioned and they're emotional and yet cold. There's a lot of very complex poses, kind of needless complexity in some people's eyes. Mannerism was first uh, described, first praised, as it were, by Max Dvorak, an art historian who also wrote an expressionist art. So the same, it's the same generation as, uh, Dvorak was the same generation as the German and Austrian expressionists. So he responded to the figural distortions and to the odd colors. It makes very good sense uh, that, that this period was rediscovered then. And this is Pontormo, his deposition, which is in Florence. So I want to give a non-Western example. It's a, it's a pre-Columbian example. 
um, to show how natural this kind of life story model can seem and how it can kind of invade scholarship and, and how it, how it um, inhabits the imagination of art historians and in this case also archaeologists. The earliest figural art in the Americas was made by the Valdivia culture in present-day Ecuador and it's, it was right in the area that I have circled there on the left, right on the coast. Like many ancient cultures, this one has a chronology that comes not from styles, but from archaeological sites. And so the earliest uh, Valdivia uh, figurines come from a site called Loma Alta, and then the archaeologists uh, name them phase one, phase two, up through phase eight, which was the most recent, the last one, the latest one, um, uh, based on their excavations. And that's roughly 5,300 BCE to 3,500 BCE. So it's, it's, it's quite ancient. It's long before the Incas, for example. The earliest figurines, beginning about 5,300 BCE, were carved from stone, like this one. There's a minimal sense of the body, and there are simple horizontal incisions for the mouth and eyes. Later figurines were made of fired clay. They were about the same size as the stone figurines. They're all tiny. They're just a couple inches high, one inch, two inches, three inches. Uh, but these later figurines had more organic forms. Sometimes a wide variety of forms were made more or less at the same time, dug up in the same um, archaeological uh, stratum. Uh, but archaeologists have been tempted to see progressions anyway. The caption that's typed into that image says, figurines showing the range from crude, ugly, to well-made, beautiful specimens. Uh, although the person who wrote this article also admits that that may not actually be a sequence in time. But there was also a progression of techniques. At first, these were made from uh, double coils of clay, and then they started to be made from uh, composites of separate pieces. And some of the later figurines also have um, coffee bean applique eyes. So the techniques um, definitely move forward in time. And it is possible to see the outlines of these stages um, of art uh, if you look at the later um, phases. Some of the figurines for the middle of the sequence of phases show a special attention to the body, like this one, even though the faces stay schematic, just as in the earliest ones, then the hair is still um, stylized. So this would be something like maturity. It's been proposed, by the way, that these hairstyles, which always remain schematic, were symbolic of different stages of development and that some of these figurines were used in puberty rituals. And if you're interested in that, you can look it up uh, in there, that reference. And then old age, the last of the figurines before the end of the culture from phase seven and eight, around 3500 BCE, these could be seen in the same way that Binkelmann saw Greek Hellenistic sculpture as quote, overly refined, too many details, delicate, not really strongly, strongly molded like the arms, for example, very delicate, um, and imitative of earlier work rather than original. So a note on um, encountering these things in art history, reading them and finding them in your art history textbooks. I think the moral would be that when you read a description that seems to depend on this ages of man model, you should be skeptical because uh, you might want to ask yourself where the author got that idea. Um, originally from uh, descriptions like Winkelmann's of ancient Greek art or even Renaissance art. So how well does it fit the art in question? And it's also good to be aware of who has valued the different ages. Writers who praise the earlier stages of youth and adolescence have usually been influenced by modernism. And writers who have praised the last stage, old age, are sometimes, have sometimes been postmodern, uh, and they identify with the culture in old age. In other words, to a certain extent, you have to be in a culture that seems to you to be similar to the stage in order to get really interested in that stage. These um, ages of man uh, or life cycle theories raise all sorts of problems. It's not clear at all why art should really develop like a human life. I mean, it's not a living thing. And if you believe this, if you find some of these interesting or plausible, then you can also ask uh, what happens after death, after the art dies, because of course cultures usually continue, so there usually is something after death, but how did that happen? Um, or you could ask, how did it get started? What started that, uh, the youth, how did the culture get started in its youth to begin with? 
Lots of problems along those lines. One of the writers who proposed a cyclical view of human history, Vico, thought that people fell into a kind of disorderly slumber and they were woken again by peals of thunder. So this is one of the ways out of this is just to say, oh, well, there's perpetual resurrection and it all cycles and life, life just continues again after people die. And so um, this, uh, this author, 18th century author Vico, um, had a, a kind of mystical theory about that, about how the ages of, uh, of uh, human culture um, would cycle this way and people would fall into this weird sleep and then get woken up again by thunderclap. That's, by the way, a, a, a frontispiece, in other words, an image that faces the title page uh, from his book, New Science, from 1725. I'm just showing it because it's a great image. It shows the um, wisdom coming down to the author and refracted or reflected off the breastplate of a figure who, who embodies wisdom. And that sun of knowledge or wisdom is also a triangle which is in fact a prism because uh, Vico was very interested in experiments on light um, and that's a prism and the colors, all the colors are coming forward um, and then going down into his, I guess they sort of go behind him. Anyway, they, go, they, they end up going into his theory and into his book. So if Western art is like a human life, then we may be in old age, something like this. Under the, under the mega period of youth, I guess you'd say there's classical and medieval, then would come adolescence of Western art, Renaissance, Baroque, and then would come maturity. Maybe that would be impressionism and modernism, and then old age, which I guess would have to be postmodern and contemporary art. That raises the possibility that uh, we're in a kind of old age or decadent uh, period. Um, that's not a new idea. You can find that, for example, in the 19th century philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche. So if you, if you think the life cycle model has some value, uh, then you might want to consider how you would arrange it in relation to um, Western art here or in relation to art of all cultures or different cultures and where you would locate yourself in it. It's also entirely possible to think of contemporary art as youth. You can always think of it as the beginning of a new age. Um, and then the question is, well, okay, what comes next? Okay, the last of these is um, paradoxical history. This is the idea that the present influences the past, that chronology actually runs uh, backwards. That's a uh, Picasso painting there, which I'm going to compare with another painting on the next screen. It's not entirely nonsensical to speak this way, um, so that uh, influence actually extends backward in time. Uh, Picasso would influence the old masters that he studied, uh, or Finkelman's 18th century ideas would influence the ancient Greek art that he wrote about. Because thinking this way is really only an image of the way that history actually builds meanings. As I look back past Picasso to see Rubens, in this case, Rubens begins to seem uh, clunkier, or maybe more extravagant, more unintentionally humorous, than he could possibly have appeared in his own time. If you start with Picasso, and then you go back to paintings like this, Rubens, one of the, um, the artists that Picasso uh, studied, then you see the Rubens in a completely different light. It's not really a historical light. Um, it's a kind of a paradoxical light because it looks like Picasso is influencing Rubens. He is influencing the way you're thinking about Rubens. So I see Rubens through um, Picassoid glasses. Uh, they're tinted with my knowledge of post-impressionism and cubism and so on. The Dutch art historian Mika Ball has written a book about Caravaggio that makes this kind of claim. She says we can only understand Caravaggio through the works of recent artists who were influenced by him. This book that she wrote is about um, artists from the 1980s and 1990s um, who were thinking of Caravaggio and Baroque art. Um, and one of Mika Ball's points is that if you, if you have that kind of art around you, that art of the 80s, 90s, 2000s that responds to the Baroque, then when you go back to the Baroque, you can't really see it in the same way. She calls this preposterous history. It's, you know, it's this little pun on pre and post, mixing up pre and post. 
Jacques Derrida, the French post-structuralist philosopher, has developed a similar theory in his book called The Postcard. So this is partly about uh, the platonic dialogues, as they're called. So if you've had these uh, assigned to you in the past, if you've read them, you know that if you, if you pick up a book uh, that um, says it's Plato's dialogue of so-and-so, what you see or what you're reading is um, a transcript, as it were, a report of conversations between Socrates and other philosophers. And in most of these books um, that are called Plato or Platonic Dialogues, Plato is actually not there. It's Socrates who's talking. So the idea is that uh, the, the common understanding is that Plato wrote down these books and they record conversations between Socrates and other Greek philosophers. And it's also commonly assumed that Socrates didn't write books, but only his student Plato did by transcribing uh, what Socrates said. Derrida was uh, really struck when he discovered this postcard of a medieval illustration because it shows Plato standing behind Socrates dictating. And Socrates is the one who's writing. So that reverses history. And it suggests that Socrates who seems to speak freely in Plato's dialogues was actually a mouthpiece for Plato and that writing came first, not speaking. Now, so history works backwards in Mika Bal's and Jacques Derrida's accounts because we can only see the past through the present and because pasts are determined by their own futures. It's paradoxical, but it's also intuitive. If you like to think of this of things this way, then you can have uh, a backwards timeline. Your mega period would be maybe postmodernism, and under that you'd have whatever you wanted, but they would go backward in time. Modernism, Renaissance, Middle Ages, Classical Greece, prehistory, I suppose. In this way of thinking, the present gives us the past, and it also prevents us from seeing the past, except from our own perspective.